Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Open Nebula webinar. We're going to give everybody just about a minute or two to to join in, and then I'll and then we'll kick off the webinar. Okay. Excuse me. All right, everyone. Well, welcome once again to our Open Nebula webinar here. Today, we're going to walk you through a really exciting webinar we have for gaming at the edge with Kubernetes and, and Agonis. OK. First thing I want to, I'm really excited that you've uh, taken note of our, our webinar series. Um, this is a, a series that we kicked off earlier this year, particularly with the, you know, the, the global situation in terms of being able to travel and, and, and hold um, in-person events. We switched over to this webinar series and, and, and actually we've been able to have you know, several really, really cool webinar events um, like the one today. Hopefully you'll keep in, in mind, keep us in mind as, as we go forward into 2021. We're sure to, to be setting up um, additional webinar events um, to bring folks to, to, to speak and, and share their insight about Open Nebula and, and technologies that, uh, um, that we're integrating with um, for your cloud solutions. Okay. There's a brief intro to the folks who are going to be joining me today. I'm Michael Abdu, I'm the customer success manager here at Open Nebula. I'm joined by Marco Mancini, a colleague of mine. He's a cloud techno, technical evangelist for Open Nebula. And we're really excited to, to have Mark Mandel here from, from Google Cloud. Um, he's a developer advocate and really gonna be sharing some cool uh, insight into um, Agonis. Okay, so this here is a, just a quick overview of our, our agenda for today. I'm gonna start with a quick introduction to Open Nebula. Then I'm gonna hand things over to Mark um, and then he can really get into um, providing some insight into what Google, Google Cloud with uh, Agonis and, and how um, we're deploying game servers. And then lastly, Mark was gonna wrap things up with a live demo utilizing Open Nebula to deploy um, K3S clusters at the edge using Ag Agonis. And then lastly, before things wrap up, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. I think what we'd li I'd like to ask you to do is um, prepare your questions and send them through the Zoom chat. Um, the closer to the end of the session, the better that way as, as we approach the Q&A um, time slot, we can kind of go through and, and answer those questions um, as they come in, okay? So here's just a, a quick intro to Open Nebula. Um, what is Open Nebula? So Open Nebula is, is an open source software platform to, to build enterprise clouds. Okay, and it's, 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 a, it's a software that's built uh, both for DevOps and development teams. So um, 
the idea here is with, you know, with your shared networking and storage resources, you can build a, um, a multi-tenant cloud environment um, with either virtual machines that are running in, in VMware, so v, vCenter servers, uh, OpenEd supports as well, KVM VMs, as well as LexD system containers, and our latest uh, release, latest version of Open Nebula supports uh, Firecracker micro VMs. So with, with Open Nebula, you can essentially create a, an enterprise cloud with any or, or all of those types of resources um, running in your cloud, okay? Some of the things that, can, that differentiate, differentiate Open Nebula from, from other products is really the, the, the self-service capabilities, the, the simplicity and flexibility with which it allows you to, to create a self-service environment and having the flexibility to provision these types of resources within your enterprise cloud um, and, and creating that multi-tenant cloud environment um, and, and having the, the elasticity to, to, to manage um, that, that environment as needed. Okay, so we have and then a Sunstone is our Open Nebula user interface. And you also have the flexibility with Open Nebula to integrate with other third-party tools like Terraform, Kubernetes, Ansible, and, and Docker. Okay. So one of the things we, we like to, to point out about Open Nebula is, is that it provides really a, a single pane of glass, right? In terms of managing your, your IT infrastructure as, and applications, all right? So you really have the flexibility to, to run any application on any infrastructure utilizing any type of virtualization, right? So as I pointed out, you can combine containers with vir virtual machines workloads, right? In, in, a, in a shared environment. You have the flexibility to create um, what we're calling a true hybrid uh, multi-cloud platform. So you can uh, utilize on-premises resources right alongside hosted resources, as well as resources provided by public cloud providers, as well as bare metal edge um, resource providers. And you can integrate, like I said, multiple virtualization technologies from the you know, full virtualization um, VM technologies to serverless um, you know, serverless micro VMs. Okay, so as a platform, you know, an open source, you know, that's the single pane of glass from an open source solution essentially provides you, you know, with the capabilities of, of avoiding vendor locking. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a solution that minimizes the complexity and, and having to utilize multiple components or multiple tools. And it reduces really the resource consumption as well as the operating cost to, to manage your, your cloud. This here is just a, a quick screenshot of, of what, you know, our, the Open Nebula Sunstone user interface looks like and, and what you can expect to see as you, as you, you go in and, and manage your, your, your cloud environment. Okay, and this slide here, it really just kind of, it's a place map for some of, you know, you know, the, the, a little bit of the history of Open Nebula and, and, and you know, how, what we're, what it's, how it's being utilized within, within the market. So, you know, op, we at Open Nebula Systems have over 10 years of experience deploying infrastructure, uh, so open source software, okay? Um, you can see here, you know, there's over 5,000 active Open Nebula clouds that are running. Um, from a scalability perspective, you know, we have the metrics here, one of the largest open, open Nebula clouds that's running um, is running with on 16 different data centers with over 300,000 cores. So, so you can see it's, you know, its capabilities in terms of its scalability. And then down below, you just kind of get a, a good look at, um, you know, who's using Open Nebula um, you know, it's, it's flexibility in being able to be utilized across multiple industries. Um, and also the fact that it's really a production ready solution. Okay. So in, in addition to managing the open source project, 
Open Nebula Systems, we provide services and, and support to organizations that, that are looking for it, right? So the basis of, of, of our, you know, of those offerings that we provide for, for enterprises is really the, our Open Nebula subscription, okay? It's, it's the key that provides you with access to our enterprise edition, right? Which provides customers with, you know, access to LTS versions of the software, as well as uh, minor enhancements and, and bug fixes. We have enterprise tools like OneScape, which uh, automates the, the, you know, the upgrading of your, your Open Nebula uh, solution. We, uh, the subscription also provides SLA-based support, right? So we have uh, you know, non-production as well as production, you know, business hours nine to five or 24 by seven support subscriptions. And then they also, these subscriptions provide you access to uh, the professional services that we provide, you know, including a cloud deployment service, we have upgrade services, uh, as well as consulting and engineering. And then it's also a key to getting access to other enterprise tools like our, our knowledge base with step-by-step um, -step guides on, on how to really take your, your implementation to, you know, to the next level. Okay, our One Edge project, this is a project that we've, um, we've been working on for the last uh, year or so, um, in which we've been focusing efforts to expand Open Nebula's capabilities and bringing those capabilities to the edge. Um, you, can, you can check out more at, at the oneedge.io website. Um, you know, this is really uh, kind of outlining some of the, the, the use cases, um, the capabilities, and some of the, and, and the things that we're bringing, bringing to Open Nebula to really allow, allow users to create not only, you know, their enterprise clouds, but expanding those clouds to, uh, to the edge. Okay. And, it, and this project really kind of originated with, you know, some of the innovative cloud disaggregation work that we've been doing. You know, this also aligned with um, the emergence of bare metal cloud infrastructure providers, right, that are coming to the market, as well as the increasing automation capability. So with those things, we've essentially built this, this platform and, and, and essentially taking Open Nebula and expanding it to be able to allow you, like I said, to expand your, your private enterprise cloud to utilize edge resources, right? So um, we've been participating in the, the Gaia X project, which is here in, in you know in Europe, um, is an initiative to um, to really bring cloud edge technology and, and sovereign cloud technology from within Europe. Um, but that's kind of integrated with our edge solution here, with uh, you know with the idea of, of having being able to create an edge catalog where users can. Um, you know, select the resources on demand, you know, and, and expand their clouds to, to utilize those resources from the, from the edge catalog and incorporate that into your open Nebula cloud. Okay, this here is just an outline of, of where you can get, how you can get started with, with one edge. Um, we have a few, you know, several screencasts um, here on, on, our, on our website, we've got one, an introductory one to you know getting started with Open Nebula, um, utilizing Mini One, which is our tool for deploying Open Nebula, um, utilizing a you know a single node um, with LXD, KVM, or Firecracker, um, and then we have our, our link to our our Firework, our latest release. It's just a, a page that kind of outlines some of the the latest developments that we've included into our um, our five point twelve. Firework um, software version. Okay. So at this point, I'm before we get into the live demo, I'm going to hand things over to to Mark. Cool. Uh, all right. Let me share my screen then. While I'm doing that, make sure I share the right one. Thank you so much to you all at Open Nebula for having me today. Let's see, that looks like the right one. All right, excellent. Everyone can see that okay? 
Yes. Uh, excellent. Well, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today and inviting me to come speak. I appreciate it. Uh, should be should be exciting. So yeah, I'm going to do a, a quick overview of Agones, um, just kind of going through the project and some of its motivations and things like that. My name is Mark Mandel, by the way, by the way as well. Um, uh, my Twitter handle is down below. It's at Neurotic. If uh, you have questions at any point in time, either you're watching the recording or you just haven't thought of it, please feel free to send me Twitter messages. Uh, I like to respond. I will always answer your questions. Uh, so it's lots of fun. Um, normally, if in the before, I would usually have a slide that said something like, who are you? And I would do a poll of the audience. Uh, since this is virtual, I can no longer do that. But um, what I, so what I'm going to assume here is that many of you are probably more familiar with Kubernetes um, and the, the underlying platform and probably a little less familiar with, uh, say, uh, what should we call it, say, like uh, multi big multiplayer games and some of the technology behind them. So uh, we'll sort of probably look at it more from, from that kind of perspective. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it'll still be valuable otherwise anyway as well. Um, it'll be fun. So where are we? So we've got about 20 minutes. All right, cool. So, uh, so what we're talking about today. So we're talking about uh, multiplayer games and multiplayer games. That's a very wide and varied set of things. Uh, we've got everything from turn-based multiplayer to like real-time multiplayer. Um, particularly, what we're talking about today is your super fast-paced real-time multiplayer games. So think like your Overwatches, your Fortnites, your Rocket Leagues, your Valorant, like those sort of games. Um, the demo we'll see in a little bit as well. Um, and, and, a, and a really fun open source uh, first person shooter is a game called Synodic. Um, so if you ever played like Unreal Tournament, you know, 2000, you know, way back in the day, yes, I have some gray hair. Um, this is like a super fast paced, you know, deathmatch style game with lots of players running around shooting each other, like lots of action going on at once. And that style of game requires a certain amount of technology, essentially to be able to ensure that all the players that are playing a game at the same time are be able to sync their information with one another in a semi-realistic way, or at least a predictable way for the players playing it, um, so that everyone can play the game at the same time and it looks like it's realistic, um, which is a bit of a tricky problem. So there's a few different ways that um, this can be done. One of I want to say most prevalent, or especially within like AAA, so like really big game studio space, is what we commonly refer to as a dedicated game server. So a dedicated game server is basically just a software process that runs usually somewhere on the internet, right? Um, and all the players will connect to that dedicated game server. And that dedicated game server does what's basically um, the full simulation of what's happening inside the game because it's the authoritative thing of what's happening inside the game. So it runs everything in memory. It keeps track of what players are where, what's interacting with what, what hits what where, who fired on whom, that kind of stuff. And basically all the players that then connect to the game are like, hey, I'm moving forward. Hey, I'm jumping up, all that kind of stuff. And then the dedicated game server sends all that information back out to all the players to say, this player did this, this player did that. Um, the way I kind of like to think about it is that um, what happens is, is actually, what often happens is, is kind of like the player asks to do something like, hey, I'm going to move forward. And the dedicated game server is going to be able to tell, hey, this is actually what happened. This is important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, if you have your uh, dedicated game server sitting on your own network, that helps solve a good chunk of cheating problems. Um, so basically, right, if I tell the game server, hey, I jumped 200 meters you know, over that way, but that's just not something my character can do, then that dedicated game server can be like, mm, no, that doesn't seem right. Uh, so we'll, we'll stop that. That seems bad. You seem to be doing something bad. Please don't do that. Um, by the same token, because we're dealing with a system that's essentially running slightly in behind time from all the players that are playing on it as well. Um, you can do all sorts of fun stuff like roll back time, play it back again, see what's actually meant to happen between the players, that kind of stuff. There's all sorts of magic and trickery that happens inside multiplayer games. The other part of it that's actually really important for why we use dedicated game servers and like particularly for today, we were talking about sort of running things on the edge as well, um, or just generally around the globe, is having control over where that dedicated game server sits means you have control over the latency of the game the person's playing. Um, so for example, 
a lot of these big multiplayer fast paced games have a latency requirement about 50 milliseconds. So like there has to be like a 50 millisecond ping time between myself and wherever that dedicated game server is. Um, so if I can place that dedicated game server geographically around the world so that it sits between the players and the people I'm playing with, um, say like I live in San Francisco, so I will probably want something that's on my side of the coast in the US. Um, that means then I can like go uh, measure that and I can place players based on those latency requirements that I have. So that gives me a lot of control and allows me to make sure that the players that are playing my game have a similar experience when they're playing each other. So uh, let's look at what a traditional architecture is going to look like. Um, usually, say you have a couple of people, they want to play a game. Usually, they connect to some kind of matchmaker. It'll match them based on social graph, skill level, things like that. And then normally the matchmaker then talks to something like a game server management system. This might start to sound a little familiar. Um, and that game server management system is its job is to basically be like, I need to find a dedicated game server uh, for players to play on. So funnily enough, it's going to go talk to a huge number of virtual machines, all of which is jobs are to be like, I have a game server process. Uh, I need to spin one up. What port is it on? Let's manage CPU and memory. This might start to sound a little familiar to you. Um, and then pull out a dedicated game server out of that set, grab its IP and port, because usually we do direct connections because everyone's playing on the same machine. Send that all the way back up through the matchmaker so that those players can then connect and play a game. And quite often, this is something that people build by hand, uh, especially in the big, the big, big game studios. Um, and I kind of was like, that seems a little sad that uh, people are reinventing this wheel all the time. Um, I mean, and several other people who also work on this project. So we were like, okay, let's take this chunk here. This is like that server manager machine cluster thing, like all of that piece. And let's build something comprehensive. Let's build something that um, is open source and enables people to do this kind of work. And funnily enough, that's exactly where we ended up. So uh, Gones is designed as a batteries included open source dedicated server hosting and scaling project. So it's basically an orchestration system for dedicated game servers that enables it to understand the life cycle of dedicated game servers, which is different from other things. So actually, let me talk about that for a sec while we're sitting here, because that is a, it is a really important point. Um, Kubernetes uh, is pretty awesome in that like, if you're running, say, something like web servers, right? They're, uh, they're stateless. You can spin them up and down. If you delete them, as long as you have enough to manage requests, easy peasy, right? No big deal. Uh, far other side, like stateful systems, like a database, you might use something like a stateful set, spin them up one at a time in a, in a ready, uh, ready order, like one, two, three, four. They sit there for ages. That's great. Awesome. Dedicated game servers are this weird thing where they're in memory state. And essentially, they're stateless if you don't have players connected to them, but they're stateful if you do have players connected to them. This means that when players uh, are on the game servers, you cannot shut them down. Otherwise, people have bad game experiences and you get bad reviews on your game, which is no good. So you need custom tooling to enable you to do that. And that's where Ghana's really kind of stepped in so that it can really handle that kind of, hey, do you have players on me? No, you don't. Cool, I can shut down this game server with impunity. Doesn't matter. Oh, you do have game servers on here. OK, then I can't shut you down. We have to do special stuff to make sure that all works. So let's get stuck in a little bit. Uh, some of this is probably going to be fairly familiar to you. So first steps first with all this stuff, uh, if we want to run uh, Agones, right? put stuff inside containers. No big deal. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with Docker containers, I think, at this point. It is pretty cool because it does mean that we can run a dedicated game server and any of its other types of binaries or any other types of dependencies it has, wrap them all up inside a nice container, and we can ship it. Nothing special going on there. So um, the example we were talking about today here with Synodic, there's nothing special about it, really. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Agones SDK, but essentially, it's a Docker file like we've all used. Here it's just Debian. I'm downloading and installing it. Uh, Synodic has some file moving things that we do to make it a dedicated game server. But like, ultimately, you know, it's an entry point, nothing that special, right? And from that, we can take it, we can build an image. There's no super magic source here. It's a standard container. So we have all the other wonderful things that can happen with containers. Um, we can take our container, you know, we can take an image here. I'm, I'm using Google Cloud Registry, I'm sure. 
you all have something similar in Open Nebula. Excuse me. I can push it up to a registry. I can share that amongst the registry, all that kind of good stuff. All standard wonderful things that Docker gives you out of the box. So that's pretty cool. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about this as well. So we also have um, SDK integrations. This is probably a bit of the special source for something like Agonos because the Agonos lifecycle stuff is a little different, or I should say actually game server lifecycle stuff is a little different. We have some, some SDK integrations. So if you're going to be using Agonos, um, there's, we have a set of existing SDKs, including Unreal and Unity, so the two big major game engines. We can also integrate with C++, Go, Rust, SDK, uh, all the good chunk of languages. The good thing is, um, if you're familiar with gRPC, it's a remote procedure call uh, framework from Google. Uh, if you have a language that supports that really well, the SDK is really just a thin wrapper around, GR, uh, around a gRPC client. So very easy to generate your own. Uh, if that's not something you're familiar with or a language that it doesn't support, or we don't have an existing SDK for you, uh, you can use the, we have a REST API, uh, so which has a Swagger spec, so you can generate your own client that way too. So lots of options for integration. But why do we have this SDK? So we're talking about game servers before being a little bit different. Quite often game servers um, really big. Uh, the Sonic demo we're going to look at now is about one and a half gig for an image. It takes like 10, 15 seconds to spin up. Uh, I've seen bigger, five gig, 10 gig images, or just lots of data pulled from outside. Game servers can take 30 seconds to spin up. So often you want to spin one up, and then you need to know, hey, once it's spun up, am I actually ready to accept connections? And that can take a while. There can be a good gap there. A good gap there. So the SDK handles that kind of lifecycle stuff, like, hey, I'm ready. Maybe you want to shut down once you've, you've played a game. Uh, maybe you want to go back to ready. There's all kinds of interesting lifecycle type uh, integrations that you can do there for within the game server because it has the game logic inside it. Uh, being able to do things like health status checking, being able to check my own configuration and watch it, which is a nice way to pass messages back on some forwards, set some configuration values, like some metadata, things like that, all kinds of other good things. Um, so it gives you a lot of control within that game server so that you can integrate your game logic, your particular game, into the lifecycle management as well, which is handy. Give you a real quick example of that. Here's the C++ SDK. Uh, please don't pick on my C++. It's terrible. But you can see really simple stuff. Uh, you create an instance of the SDK. We do a block and connect to make sure everything's all connected. And we wait. Uh, and then we're like, hey, we're ready now. Let's go. Sweet. Um, that's really kind of as simple as it is. We might be loading map data, all that other kind of stuff otherwise. So that's all awesome. We can, you know, like I just showed you, like we can do a singular container for a dedicated game server. I can show you the SDK integration, but ultimately we want to run at scale. Yeah, so we want to run lots and lots and lots of these. And because we're, we're talking about like game servers, we probably actually want to set up like lots and lots of these as warm game servers that we want to have, like just kind of lying around waiting for us to use. So let's talk a little bit about that. So we talked a bit about containers, probably unsurprisingly, we'll talk a little bit about Kubernetes too. Again, we're all pretty familiar, but this was honestly a great base for building this product on. Um, if you, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this too, um, but if you've used Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes is great in that Kubernetes is extensible. So not only do you have this huge ecosystem of tools and this great uh, set of people who are working on Kubernetes, making it all like an amazing, amazing project, but it is very extensible. So if you've used Kubernetes, you probably use like things like pods and deployments and things like that and services and whatnot. But those nouns that you see in those resource definitions like pods and services, you can add your own. They're called custom resource definitions. Uh, and there's a bunch of other extension mechanisms that are in there as well. And that extends both kubectl, so uh, the command line client, which we'll see it a little bit uh, towards the end, and uh, also the Kubernetes API itself, which is immensely powerful. I'm really impressed with the system they built here. And it really meant that we could build an amazing, amazing platform on top of Kubernetes, take advantage of everything that it does, um, and just really focus on this orchestration model that we needed for our game servers. <clears throat> My dog's going to do something in a minute. You'll see it. You'll hear it at some point. So what does that look like then? So what we were able to do, which is really awesome, is we're able to create this game server custom resource definition. Uh, we pair that with some software, often called a controller. 
uh, which is able to react to it and do interesting things. And so now we can actually say to, um, to Kubernetes, hey, create me a game server, which is super cool. Um, we can give it a name like we would do normally. Uh, for because we're making direct connections, we don't use services. So we uh, actually correct, connect directly to the port. Uh, so we do some port management for you, something that Agonis gives you out of the box that Kubernetes doesn't have. Um, we do that. We manage the, the routing of that for you. So here we have a dynamic port. So we're going to dynamically assign a port. Uh, we connect to the local port. And then we're able to define an entire uh, pod template. So here we're defining um, the container that we need to use for this particular game server. Uh, and we can do the full pod, pod template specs. So if you want to do volumes or config maps or anything like that, you can totally do that as well. So this now means that what we can do now is we can say, all right, players can connect to our custom matchmaker. We can talk to the Kubernetes API. Uh, as you can see, like everything we do through kubectl, you can also do through the API. Uh, connect to Agones and spin up a game server. And then the players can connect, which is pretty cool. Don't get me wrong. But we can take that a little bit further. So we touched on this a little bit before as well. Um, if you're running these game servers, usually they're quite large. They can take a while to spin up. What you actually want to do is run what we call a fleet. Um, and a fleet is basically just a big set of warm game servers that are just sitting there waiting for players to show up. Uh, usually run a small buffer of them. Uh, we have some auto scaling stuff I'm not going to talk about today, but that stuff exists. But if you've used pods and deployments, this is very similar. This is a fleet that specifies how many game servers do you want to run? That's really it. Um, you know, we can change this in the kubectl command line or through the API, how many we can make it go up and down. We've also got some auto scaling stuff. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about it today, um, but that capabilities do exist. And here we're just then going to specify the game server that we want to run. So that works out pretty well. So now we're like, OK, here we can run two instances of a Sonata uh, game server. Maybe you want to run 10, maybe you want to run 1,000. Uh, I run load tests up to about 4,000, I think I was running yesterday, just for funds uh, on, a, on a reasonably big cluster. And uh, so you can scale that up and down depending on your game server needs. But let's take this even one step further, because that changes things, right? We, uh, we don't want to be spinning up instances usually on the fly, like individual ones. It's a little harder to manage. Uh, fleets are really important, because then we can do things like, here's my fleet. Also, maybe I have a new image, and then I want to roll out a new image. We can roll that out as well. But this makes things fun, because we don't use services, right? How do we manage that? So because we're making direct connections, and also we need to be aware of, um, is there a player playing on this particular game server? We have this concept of what we call allocation. So here I'm doing it in YAML. You'd probably do it through the Kubernetes API. Um, we also have some externally facing like gRPC and REST endpoints that you can connect to as well to do the same thing. But I'm able to say, hey, create me a game server allocation. And it can then return back me a game server IP and port. So here I'm saying, here's a game server allocation. Uh, we're going to specify, you know, here we're actually just doing match labels. So it's just going to scan all the game servers we have in our system that match this. So here we're saying which this particular Synodic fleet match that. And then it's going to go, OK, I'm going to grab the appropriate one for you. And I'm going to hand it back to you. And I'm going to mark it as allocated. And allocated is super special because that indicates to the system, hey, we have players on there. And um, don't ever touch it. So if you do updates to the fleet, you scale the fleet up and down, all that kind of stuff. That game server is never going to go away unless it's explicitly deleted. So that's one of the huge powers of Agones is it handles that lifecycle. You have players on a game. You have in-memory state. You cannot interrupt it. So we won't let you unless you're very explicit about it. Um, and that's where allocations come in. So a bit more of an imperative command rather than a declarative command like you were used to in Kubernetes. But we sort of hack the system a little bit. And uh, we make that work uh, quite nicely for us. So like we were seeing before, Here's our Agones architecture. We're able to say, here, let's have a huge, big set of warm fleet of game servers. And when we want one, we can hey, give me an allocation. It'll give me one of those game servers, the appropriate one, according to some like resource usage rules. Give me the IP import. And then those players can then play that game. Whew, whirlwind tour. Uh, super, super quick. 
there is also um, a host of other features we haven't even talked about. So as we're seeing today, this works across uh, cloud providers, vanilla Kubernetes, that's what it works on. Uh, fleet and node auto scaling, we we're touching on that. We use the Kubernetes auto scaler, local development tools, lots of metrics and dashboards, ping latency utilities, lots more. Still going with active development as well, uh, including metric collection and display. We're going to expand that out uh, and more sophisticated allocations uh, and Windows hosting is on the roadmap as well. Awesome. Um, I'm going to skip over the next bit. Uh, so uh, actually, um, so wrap up super, super fast. We're able to take our dedicated game server. We can chuck it in a container and then we can run it at scale thanks to the power of Agones sitting on top of Kubernetes, giving us a huge number of tools out of the box. Uh, this is usually where I take questions, but actually this is the demo section, so we're going to pass that over to our friends. But uh, yes, if you want to follow me and any of the work that I do, uh, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or follow me on Twitch or YouTube. Or YouTube. Awesome. I'll hand it back over to the Open Nebula crew. OK. Thanks, uh, Mark, uh, a lot for uh, your presentation. So let me um, uh, share my screen. OK, so um, um, as, I, um, as I said, um, as Amy said, we will now move to a demo. So we are going to show how to deploy Kubernetes clusters at the edge and uh, with the tools no, provided by Open Nebula. And um, first of all, I would like to introduce some of the tools that we are going to use. As uh, Mark said, uh, for multiplayer gaming, uh, latency is important. So it's uh, very important to, uh, to deploy resources that are close no, to the players in order to reduce uh, latency for uh, playing uh, like face-based games like uh, first-person shooter or other kind of games. So uh, Open Nebula now comes with the tools that uh, you can um, allocate resources on the edge, so close to the users for uh, multiplayer game servers. Uh, in order to do this, uh, um, we have the one provision tool, so where you have to define a, a YAML file that will define the infrastructure that uh, should be allocated on the edge. Um, Open Nebula uh, exploit bare metal servers that are uh, provided by third party providers like uh, AWS, Equinix, or Google uh, Cloud, and so on. So, um, so once we validate the provision file, we can, um, the YAML file, we can provision resources. So before, um, let me just. Uh, uh, connect one moment. So I prepared already a, a, a YAML file. So this is will deploy um, a resources on uh, on Equinix Meta. So we can use the, the one provision tool, and uh, we will use this uh, file that I will uh, describe uh, in uh, very quickly now. So let's first start the provisioning because this is usually takes uh, five, 10 minutes according also to the bare metal provider. So what so a, a YAML file looks like is uh, usually a, here you have to define some uh, resources so that can be hosts, networks, uh, a data stores uh, for images, uh, files uh, in uh, Open Nebula. So in this case, we are going to deploy hosts with uh, Firecracker on uh, a facility uh, on Equinix uh, Metal, that is uh, the Amsterdam uh, facility. Um, and here you, we can specify the driver. Ec now it's called Equinix, but is uh, when uh, first was called the packet and then was acquired by Equinix Metal. So you have to um, use in the, your uh, YAML file, the token uh, and the project ID that uh, are uh, defined in your uh, dashboard. And then you can specify the type of uh, instance that you can use as the operating system. So in this uh, example, we are just going to deploy one host by using uh, Firecracker as an hypervisor. And then we are going to define three data stores, one for the images. So where we are going to import a Docker image for uh, K3S, for 
also to deploy Kubernetes clusters. And then you have a system image for micro VM and the files for the kernel that I will explain. And then there are a couple of networks, one for the private and um, for the private one and the other for having a public IP on the, on the network. So once you uh, define this uh, YAML file with the resources, as I showed you, then you can use the one provision command to create, okay? So this is in order to um, having uh, resources within your, uh, usually your deployment that uh, is, uh, for example, a local deployment, okay? So let me, I just uh, showed you how to, to deploy these resources. Let me go back uh, to the presentation. Um, then once you deploy resources, so now uh, Open, uh, Open Nebula can uh, uh, provide also tools that uh, allow you to deploy applications. So now th there is this uh, container, um, a native model in integrated with Open Nebula that is based uh, on uh, Firecracker Micro VM plus uh, Docker Hub. And this allow us to deploy containers by using uh, Open Nebula orchestration tools that, uh, in, that has already developed for uh, a virtual machine. Uh, but uh, Open Nebula integrates also with, uh, um, with a, an appliance that uh, is related to Kubernetes based on a virtual machine. We have also driver for Docker machine that can be used also with the range. But today, what we are going to, to talk about is how to use Firecracker plus uh, Docker Hub to deploy, for example, a Kubernetes clusters. So by using, uh, uh, sorry, okay. So by using uh, uh, Firecracker, what we can do is uh, to create a micro VM and uh, this micro VM is, uh, are, are secure like uh, VM, but they are very quick to start. And uh, also they can uh, integrate with the, all the stacks that are already provided by Open Nebula. So the network stacks, the storage, and so on. So we can create based on Firecracker, multi-tenants environment. And so we can provide really container uh, as a service by using especially the integration with, uh, uh, with the Docker app. And um, also by using one flow, we can uh, also orchestrate multi micro VM applications. So for example, in uh, our case, what we are going to consider is um, as an application, the uh, P3S cluster. So we have a Docker image uh, that uh, we are using a custom image of a K3S because uh, still there is some work that we need to do in order to integrate with the uh, image that is uh, available from Ranger. But the idea is that once you have a Docker image uh, on Docker Hub of uh, any application, in this case K3S, what we can use is uh, using one flow to define a service where we have different components, in this case, a K3S server and uh, maybe multiple agents, and then we can uh, deploy on uh, on the nodes that are on the edge that we have already deployed and integrated with our, within our Open Nebula setup by using uh, one provision. So um, uh, today, what I'm going to show is um, how to provision a node. And also, I already showed you uh, how to create a node on the Amsterdam facilities on Equinix. Then once the node has been set up, we are going to, uh, to show how to uh, set up a K3S clusters on it and how to deploy Agones on, uh, in, on the Kubernetes cluster. And then we will deploy a, a game server. Uh, as uh, Mark uh, said, we, in this case, we are going to deploy the first part of the Mark talk uh, in the sense that we are going just to deploy game servers, but uh, as you learned from uh, his talk is uh, the possibility with Agones is to also create fleet and uh, also to manage uh, game servers at, uh, at scales. Um, so let me go um, now on the demo. Um, Okay, first of all, uh, let's see. Okay, I have deployed this host, so the provisioning is done, as you can see. So here you can use one provision also to list, uh, and this has been uh, allocated. 
Um, so here we, we have uh, the three data store associated that has been created. So the first thing that we, we need to do is to import uh, um, the, the Docker image, in this case, uh, the Kubernetes one on the image data store that has been created on the, on, the, on the edge. So as I said, this is a custom image that we are using. And um, since uh, we are working on integrating the original one that is provided by the user. Um, also, in order to deploy micro VMs with the Firecracker, we need uh, a kernel. Also, in this case, uh, we have prepared a kernel that um, is, uh, uh, contains the VXLAN module, that is uh, compiled with VXLAN because this is needed for K3X. So we are going to, to import this uh, kernel on the, on the data store. Um, sorry, maybe there is already, no, sorry. What? Ah. Selected the wrong name. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, the kernel. Now, in order to provision a Kubernetes cluster, we, we are going to do this with one flow. So the orchestrator, the tool for orchestrating multi-VM application on Open Nebula. So we have defined a couple of templates, one for the server, for the k server. And uh, here we are going to, um, I have some issue with the network. It seems that you are not. Okay. So in, here we can define a DOM for the, for example, for the server, we can define the memory, the number of CPU. Um, we associate uh, as an image the, the Kubernetes, uh, the K3S image for as a disk. And then we can define the networks, one uh, private network and the, the other one is the public one. This is as an alias of the private. And uh, for uh, deploying Firecracker micro VMs, we need, as I said, we need the kernel. So we can select the term that we have imported in the, before in the files uh, data store. Um, just let me show also for the context, uh, we have, uh, I will uh, tell you about this. Uh, we have a file that uh, contains some, uh, the execution of the K3 server and set up some uh, variables that are needed to, to set up, you know, to start the, the K3 server. Um, and then we set also the host name. So we can update this uh, template. And the same thing we are going to do for the agent. So let me qu quickly update uh, also this. So give the image, uh, the network as an alias and the, the kernel. Uh, also in this case, uh, for the contextualization, we have a different init script that will set up the agent and the host name also we add this um, a variable, so the idea the VM, so every agent that can is created will have a different host name that is uh, needed for deploying a cluster with multiple agents. So we can, so the network, we can update this. And then what uh, I have um, also prepared is a, a template for the, for one flow where we had defined the two roles. So one for the server, and we associate the template for the server and one for the agent. So, and uh, OneFlow allow you also to, to define elasticity. You can scale the service so you can uh, allocate multiple agents and so on. So once we define also the OneFlow service, we will try to deploy now. Okay, so let's create a service. So now it's in deploying state and the ear is creating uh, the, uh, the server. So the host is uh, available. So now this will be, uh, um, sorry, this uh, VM will be allocated uh, on, the, on the host. Um, just very quick, uh, let me just uh, go. So 
through this init script. So there are a couple of init scripts. So one is for the server that he needs to, so here we are going to run the K3 server. So there are some uh, options that we pass, that is the local IP, the external IP. And we use uh, in this script the one gate, that is the metadata server of uh, Open Nebula. And uh, for the agent, instead, we are going to get we are going to use the one gate. So we are going to get the server ID, and then we are going to get the token that has been generated when the server starts, and then we will run the agent with the different option for connecting to the server and the local and also the external IP. So this is just to show this. So there are two different scripts. So that's why we have a couple two templates: one for the server, one for the agent. So once this is running, uh, so now we have uh, the public IP of the server. So let's see. So let's copy first the, um, I have to change the IP, I think. Yeah. So let's first copy the Kubernetes uh, configuration file. So we have to change the local IP with this, the public IP. Okay, and then uh, just export and uh, let's see. Okay, so the master now is ready and uh, it should allocate also now the, so the agent. So the agent uh, uh, should be, let's see if it's running, why is it not running? I know it's very, we are very close to the no to the end of the so let me because um, okay I see it's still an, it's set up, setting up but uh, what we can do is uh, just create the namespace of uh, for Agones so first create the namespace and then what we can do is uh, to apply this um, YAML file that is uh, the Agones um, to, uh, to install Agones on the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And then we can check uh, the pods in the Agones. Um, okay, so this is running. Um, so once you have uh, uh, the Agonist systems running, so we can deploy a game server. So in this case, we can have, uh, so this is just to deploy a game server. So this is not uh, a fleet. So in this case, we are just deploying the Exonotic game server. And um, this can be done by using, again, uh, apply. And uh, so this should conduct the game server and then we can do get game server. As we see here is a schedule it. Here we see the address and the port. If we look at the um, pods, which is creating, and this is because it's pulling the image. So uh, this is not a work game, a warm game server because this is should be a pulled. Let's see if I can show. Yeah, as you see, this is pulling. This is about, I don't know, two gigabytes maybe. Uh, so it's uh, an image that is uh, now is pulling. So once finished pull, the game server will be ready and then we can uh, connect. So let me show first, I don't know, if you have the client installed, you can try to connect uh, in few minutes to this. But uh, let's see when it's ready. Still not ready. It's taking some time to pull the image. Oh, okay. Okay, now the, the server is ready. So here we have the public IP and the, the port. So if we run uh, the Exonotic game client, And uh, we can click on multiple, I don't remember now the IP, sorry. Okay. So here, you can put the address here. 
84 and uh, uh, to, to nine. To nine. And then you have to put also the, the port that is uh, 718. So when you put the address and the port, then you can click uh, join. And now the, the game server. I don't know if someone has declined, they can join with the same IP and address. Um, and I think my game crashed, maybe. No, I don't know. OK, and now you can see that I'm unfortunately with the touchpad, so I'm not so good uh, in moving, uh, especially in the but this is, you can see that we are, um, and uh, as you can see, the, we are in Amsterdam, so I have a very nice latency with the, the game server. It's very close to the, I'm very close to the server, okay? Um, okay, so I think we are in, in time because uh, we are very close to the, to the end of the, where is my, sorry, I cannot see my, okay, ah, here it is. Okay, so <laughs> was very- Neurotic was me, Marco, eh? I had to shoot you, I'm sorry. Sorry? <laughs> Neurotic was me, I had to shoot you, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, so it's, uh, uh, I think we, we, we are uh, in time, right? So we did in time and uh, 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 I don't know if there are some questions. And, um, Thank you, Marco. No, I think uh, we're just about at time. Um, if anybody has a, any quick questions they wanna send through the chat, I'd recommend you do that now. Um, otherwise- uh, AP and the port. Someone was asking, yeah. this is the P, oops, sorry. I can, I, it's still uh, up, so is, uh, so let yeah. me give you the IP and this is the port. So if you have the client, I can. Uh, Very cool. You should, uh, you should see the, let me see if I can connect also. The, the game server, okay. Um, so, Mark, we have a question here about whether Agones is able to run game servers in the same port for TCP UDP. Yeah, we actually added that a little while ago. Uh, so, if you've got a, a a previously built game server that needs to run UDP and TCP on the same port, yeah, you can do that. Uh, we have inside the port policies, we have both TCP, UDP, and TCP, UDP, <laughs> which is uh, more of a decision that happened because of legacy reasons uh, rather than anything else. Uh, but yeah, if you need to do that, we can totally do that. Cool. All right. Um, actually, we have a few things that's probably interesting on that too. Um, so we'll do what we call dynamic as uh, usually the default. So we'll randomly assign you the uh, ports that get passed through. Um, there are a bunch of older game servers that actually specifically need to know what port they're on before they start up or they expect to know that their, their starting point is the same port that is exposed externally. Um, so we actually have what we call a pass-through system um, where, uh, whatchamacallit, where we can actually also have the config uh, send through, or the game server container is expected to run on the same port as pass through. So you can check the configuration and pass it through as well. Um, and so you can do that kind of stuff for, for those kinds of game servers. Is there a recommended solution for stored game assets? Um, yeah, that usually comes down to, um, we usually punt that over to Kubernetes. So if you want to stick stuff in a Docker container, sometimes you can do that if that works for you. But yeah, 15, 20 gigabytes, it's big. Um, we have a lot of people who will just do volume mounts and pre-populate their volumes through however they like to do that. Uh, we have people who store stuff on the node, so you can do that either on the file system itself, on an SSD, if you want to do in-memory file stores, uh, depending on what works best for your game platform. So you have a few different options there. We kind of punt that over to Kubernetes. There is um, some work, uh, I'll have to go find it. It's either a cap or there's some, pro um, some projects, and I've forgotten the details on just general pre-population of volumes is a general Kubernetes problem, uh, which is, is pretty much a general Kubernetes problem. Um, so there is some work that way too. But usually uh, someone either 
populates a persistent disk of some kind and ships that out to everything. You could run a, a small like um, network attached storage type thing inside your clusters. There's a few different ways you could solve that problem. It really sort of depends on what works well for your workflow, but that is also a good question. Um, it also comes down to life, life, um, life cycle management of the versions of your game. Great thing about Kubernetes or, or containers is they're immutable, which makes it great because you're like, you know exactly what you have. As soon as you start putting mutable elements, like such as volume mounts, um, that changes things. And so you need to be able to manage that properly as well. And that sort of comes down to how your authoring process works and that kind of stuff as well. But it's a good question. We talk about that a lot. Excellent. All right. I think what we'll do, uh, we'll, if, if any of you folks have any additional questions, I'd you know, recommend do not um, hesitate to, to reach back out to us at Open Nebula. Um, and you also have Mark's contacts that he included in his, in his slideshow. Be sure to reach out to Mark um, as well. We are gonna be publishing a recording of this, this event probably within a day or two. So just be on the lookout for, for that. Um, and lastly, I just want to give a big thanks to you, Mark, for, for joining us and, and sharing that, that quick, me. really cool overview on, on Agones. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Keep, in, keep us uh, in view for upcoming webinars. OK? Hey, thanks to you all. Okay. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye now.